Hi, and welcome to the Keys to Therapy. Today's guest is Kamisha. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Samantha. I'm really excited about doing this with you. Yeah, I'm excited too. We got a lot of good stuff to talk about today. So, Mm -hmm. well, before we get fully started, do you want to let the audience know a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Kamisha Brewer Dickerson. I'm an LP. See, to sing here in the state of Arkansas, I am a speaker and a two-time author of the books Thought Life Confessions and now the CEO clinician, and I'm a business coach for new and established therapists. So I teach therapists how to set up, structure, market, and scale their mental health private practice in just 60 days. So I'm really excited about all the work I do and all the amazing people I get to serve. Yeah. Oh, that is so great because, you know, as uh, you know, and some of the viewers know, the main purpose of this channel is teaching therapists what they didn't learn in grad school. And I Mm -hmm. never even heard anything about private practice in grad school. That was like a, don't say anything. Yeah. Scary. I was like, but what is it though? You know, I cannot do it. Is it okay? Like I was that student in grad school. Yeah, me too. Got kicked out of class once. (laughs) We we all were like, excuse me, uh, can you just share this? And it wasn't, it wasn't right for her. So, oh, but, so I get that, but I think it's good that you teach this because there's not a lot of business knowledge that is put into our education as therapists. So when we want to go those routes, we don't usually know how or what resources to, to find or to get to, or to seek out. So I love that you provide this and we're going to get into all of that more today. So let's get some business minded therapists out here. Let's go. <laughs> Well, how did your journey start? What made you decide that you wanted to be a therapist? So I had a very interesting journey for becoming a therapist. My parents were pastors. And so Mm. my family were educators. I have a background in education. I was teaching in education, special education before I became a counselor. So all I have ever seen was entrepreneurship and speaking and professional speakers and all things ministry, pastoral counseling, like all the things serving the people like that's Uh just in my blood. And that's all I know. And so I'm very grateful for that community oriented aspect. But I got a chance to listen to my parents do pastoral counseling Mm -hmm. and couples counseling with a lot of families. Sometimes it was at church, you know, in my dad's office. Sometimes it was at our house at the kitchen Uh table. And so I was always that kid listening in when I wasn't supposed to be because I wanted to, you know, hear people's business because I was curious about because you know people didn't come to our house unless something was wrong like we had visitors and they would come over but if you're at the table and it's like an intervention where both of my parents are there they're working on something it's like a life skill behavior modification plan Mm -hmm. communication we working on some stuff and so I noticed that through their teaching some people didn't have to come back to the house as much some Mm -hmm. people had less meetings with my dad at the at the church in the pastor's office and some people we saw them on a regular basis so the kid in me was like what's different about these people and Mm -hmm. these people why are they getting different results why did they get a divorce and now they've got custody battles and visitation with their kids like what happened so I wanted to understand human behavior And so seventh, eighth grade, I knew I wanted to be a therapist. I started studying like serial killers. I was going into forensic psychology. And then I was like, wait, it's too many dead bodies. I don't know if I can do it. I was having nightmares and stuff, but I was really intrigued. But I'm like, what else can I learn about human behavior and how complex we are as human beings? And how can I help and how can I serve? And so that was just something that interested me. And I have always been interested in that. And I continue to study human behavior and help people to start shifting their thoughts into alignment with their goals so that their behaviors match and like that's my jam but that's how I got started as to why I wanted to be a therapist yeah I love that because I feel like all of us are a little nosy Mm -hmm. just a little bit (laughs) so I love that you said that now we get to reframe it as curious but we're just all nosy Mm -hmm. we want to know what's going on (laughs) yeah and why like why are you still doing that we talked about this what's what's difficult for you is there a barrier like yeah I want to figure that out and help them make those changes exactly yeah so it's like taking that quality and using it in a really positive way and like I said if you can take it that's it's more curious you're helping them be curious about themselves too Mm -hmm. so I really like that and it's interesting that with the background that you had, you saw so many different types of counseling coming through in your own home. Yes. So interesting. Yes. And 
and even with seeing the different types of counseling, I don't think my parents ever phrased it as counseling. I didn't learn later until I was in graduate school at a Christian university that like marriage and family therapy was a thing. Like I didn't know that was like a whole degree track. Now I chose the professional counseling program over the systemic approach. Um, we can talk about that later too, but <laughs> I just wanted to find my path. But I was like, I don't think they knew they were counseling. Mm -hmm. And they were really good at it because I never heard the term in my home because I'm in the South, I'm in Arkansas, people still, we're new to the mental health industry of going to therapy and it being accepted. We're typically pray about it, get your demons out the way, and that's it and move on. So to see them do the thing with no language yeah. for the interventions and the treatment plans they were doing in a pastoral setting, mind blowing to me, but I'm I thank God for it because I got a chance to see what it could look like in an out of the box setting at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be the stuffy clinical textbook version of what we learned in grad school. So hence the need for me to do private practice because I wanted to do it the way I saw it, which was the out of the box, mm -hmm. really meaningful, super impactful type of counseling that really helps people transform their lives. Yeah. Especially if you saw it work. So mm -hmm. But I love that that was your introduction to it because I feel like for most people, their biggest introduction to therapy, unless they went themselves in some capacity, but even then it's sort of that one interaction um, yeah. or that one dynamic. When you're in school, it is the stuffy. You take all the notes and the, hmm, and you, what theory am I using? Mm -hmm. And especially yeah. role plays, the worst. But if it's those types of things and they're judging you on, <laughs> are you asking the question this way? You're doing this. It's so formal. And so um, I guess like, stuffy and just kind of boring in a lot of ways mm -hmm. when it's like presented in such a cold clinical way. So I like that you took the framework that you saw with your family and the people coming through and how they would likely adjust their style a little bit, come at it with a different approach to then something that was just more like foundational theoretical. And you combined the two in a way that fit who you are, because yeah. I don't know about your program, but I know mine did not talk about who I was at all. It was all about the clients and who they me to me to be always always and I I felt like I was going to get lost in my practice if I mm -hmm. kept that everything's about the clients nothing's about Kamisha I'm like I'm only with them an hour a week so when yeah. the treatment plan's done my notes and I've submitted the claim this is no longer about the client so what about me what do I get to do how do I get to feel in the container of this business model that I've built and can I do it like is it legal is it ethical but how do I do it? Because mm -hmm. I haven't seen that model either. I've just seen, you know, a lot of therapists experiencing burnout and complaining about what they did because everything was about the clients. So yes, I teach therapists how to make it about the clients and about themselves too. Right. Cause there needs to be that balance there. So yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned that that's part of what made you want to start your own practice was being able to do things mm -hmm. on your terms. So how was that process for you? Starting my practice was rough because um, I was I was in inpatient. So I worked all the way through inpatient. I worked in admissions. I worked overnights. I worked second shift, day shift. Like I worked all the shifts. And then I got, I got licensed and I was like, I want to go to the floor. I want to work on the unit. I want to be with the kids. And sometimes before that daytime therapist spot came open, I was working a weekend shift on all units of the hospital, just doing intakes all day long on a Saturday for like 10, 12 hours. It was insane. But I told my supervisor, I was like, I don't want to do this forever. Like I can't retire doing this. This is not enough money, first of all, but mm -hmm. the types of people that I'm seeing, like they're so far out of my scope. Like I know nothing about this. I'm not interested in this at all. They are in here for a reason I know it's inpatient but like it was it was chemical dependency it was psychosis mm -hmm. it was sexual assault it was regular depression it was bipolar like it was all the things and I was like I don't want to do this forever so I asked him I said so how long is it going to take me to build a private practice he said oh at least two years I said oh absolutely not I don't have two years of this <laughs> there has to be a quicker way for me to figure this out. And he's like, no, that's how long it takes to build a caseload and get traction. I'm like, mm -mm. my parents are entrepreneurs. I know how to build a business. So let me just use my business skills to get this private practice built. And that's what I did. So I was at the agency, still working inpatient. I had even moved departments to PHP and IOP. So I got a lot of experience 
experience working there, but I was building my practice the entire time. So yes, I'd go in early work seven to three, and then I'd leave, go see clients. I didn't even have an office. I was using an office at a church um, until I got enough money to get my own space. I put that in the book because it's a chapter. I shouldn't have done that. It was really bad. I wasn't ready to pay for my own office space, but I did. So I was seeing clients in the evenings. I saw clients on Saturdays and I was all in building that case up so that I could leave. And I did it until it was costing me money to stay at the agency because I had so many clients. So that was the mm-hmm. quick version of how I transitioned into private practice, but it was not pretty. But thankfully, I was raised around entrepreneurs who taught me marketing and business and foundations and operations. Um, my family, they had a business in addition to speaking and being a pastor and doing mm-hmm. all the things. So I was like, I know how to build a business. This isn't going to take two years. It shouldn't take two years. So it's not going to take two years. I'm going to make sure it does not take two years. And it didn't. So that was my journey. And I just did it. And Christmas day of 2020, your girl was out. Best yes. Christmas gift ever. <laughs> <laughs> and what a way to start the next year too. Be like, all right, oh, I'm yeah. on my own. let's go. Yeah. Uh, terrified. But I was like, I'm out here now. I turned in that letter. I'm not going back. So let's yeah. make this thing work. <laughs> I love it though, because again, you focused on you and mm-hmm. that's something that it almost feels taboo sometimes in this field. Like people say like self-care, you know, burnout, you hear these like words, but nobody really teaches you how to prevent those things, like how to prevent the burnout or how to engage in self-care, what that might look like for somebody. And sometimes self-care is leaving the job that is stressed yes. out. So, absolutely, and like you said, and I love that is if there wasn't, it wasn't seeming like there was a place that was aligned with your values, how you wanted to work, who you wanted to work with, then you created it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. And it was so freeing to do it. Like I know I was scared. I was having panic attacks leading up to the day. And I was talking to my husband about, we had just gotten married. So this was about to be a major shift (laughs) with us in finances and us merging bills anyway. And he was like, babe, just do it. I'm like, but are you sure though? Are you still going to love me if my practice fails? He's like, you have a ton of clients. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, okay, (laughs) you're right. Just need a little reassurance. Okay, I'm in. So I remember typing up my letter and crying and shaking. I still have the voicemail from where my clinical director called me to say, hey, I got your resignation letter. Just want to check and see if you're okay. I'm like, now you want to check and see if I'm okay. But we've been telling you, you know, it was a disaster down here for a while. But yeah, I keep the voicemail. So anytime I don't feel like working on my business or I'm scared or intimidated by the next phase of private practice, I'll go back and listen to the voicemail. And it's a reminder of just all of the chaos I endured before I made the decision to transition out. But yeah, it had to be about me Mm -hmm. to make it work and not just about the people I served. Absolutely. Because ultimately, if you're not in a good space your clients aren't going to be getting the best version of you, which means you're not going to be getting the best care. And then Mm -mm. what are you doing? So I think that makes sense. And, you know, I think sometimes there's this, um, I don't know if it's like stereotype. I honestly think it's kind of rude, (laughs) but sometimes people think private practice is bougie, right? Like, oh, you at the, I'm at an agency. I'm putting in the work. I'm at a hospital. It's like, most of us did that to start and then realized it was not with us. Like it wasn't aligned for us. No, not at all. And I'm not that business coach to tell people, oh, you should leave. Like, I think you should leave when you're ready, Mm -hmm. when it financially makes sense, when you have enough business structure and foundation in place to not get out here and be broke and have to go crawling back to your agency or another agency and be embarrassed by it. Like, don't do it until you're absolutely ready, because honestly, it's not for everybody. No. And so if you're not business savvy and you're super introvert I'm introverted but I only allow my introvertedness to keep me limited for a certain amount of time Mm -hmm. like I know sometimes all right Kamisha it's podcast day put on your big girl undies and let's go do this podcast interview be friendly be (laughs) extroverted and then we'll recharge like I know I have to do those things but it's because I like the way I live Mm -hmm. I like having my practice I like having the flexibility I blocked off the rest of my clients for today Because I felt like it. There's no way I could have done that working at an agency. So those are the types of decisions I wanted to be able to make. Mm -hmm. And if I get tired next week, I'm blocking off more days. I don't have to wait until my PTO gets approved. Yeah. Because it may not be approved depending on staffing, which isn't my problem. But those are the types of things I wanted to be able to do. 
Exactly. So I think that that's a big piece of it is therapists need to be connected with themselves and their needs and be in tune with what's that burnout look like for them. What mm-hmm. waking up frustrated every day, dreading going to work. Like some of the things like you mentioned, look, working with people who are outside your scope that you just feel like this isn't even rewarding for me. It's no, what am I doing? Especially when you're still paying them bills for the student loans. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> they want their money every month. Mm-hmm. <laughs> True. So, I mean, some of those things can be fears and stuff that keep you there. So, you know, um, like we talked about, a lot of therapists don't have that business uh, education, maybe not necessarily that business mindset. So why do you think it's important for a therapist to develop a business mindset and get that education in entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think it's important because it it's going to save them time. It's going to save them money and it's going to help them not take things personally when they happen so when a client decides okay I'm not coming to therapy anymore it may not be about you and your clinical skills maybe they were not ready or maybe the marketing was off and they thought you were trained in a specific area and you were not you said you were trauma trained but you really are only good at (laughs) very specific types of trauma and these other traumas that they have were outside of your wheelhouse and they knew that and they decided to move on that's not personal you're not a bad person you're not a bad therapist so the business mindset kicks in it's a little bit of a protective mechanism for you to say like okay this this ain't about me like they did what was best for them Mm -hmm. and what was in their best interest as they should because i think the business mindset also helps to to think about it like okay if I were looking for a therapist as a therapist and they didn't do what I needed why would I stay like that doesn't make sense it's not a good use of my money and my time so when it's business it becomes less personal and it helps you to make more business-based decisions about the type of clients you want to work with how much you're charging sliding scale oh my god sliding scale I I have a different take on sliding scales. I don't feel like we should be sliding to wherever. I think we should have, this is my rate. This is what I slide to. What can you do in the middle? Like, I think that should be, there should be parameters around sliding scales. So it's not, so we're not running private practices like community mental health clinics. Of pay what you can and it might be five dollars like we can't do that in private practice we have too much overhead and not to say you have a lot of bills but you got to pay all of them for your EHR and your computer and software systems like you got to pay for that so you can't take five dollars for a therapy session and so when you have the business mindset it keeps you accountable keeps you honest keeps you making good decisions for you and for your clients but it also helps you to build the type of private practice that will take care of you long term So now we can start talking about multiple streams of income, passive income. I don't think passive is a thing. I think it passes more like you do less work later. You do a lot of work up front, less work later, but nothing's really just straight up passive. Even Mm -hmm. if you're investing, you got to go make the money first to be able to invest Mm -hmm. it. And then it becomes less work, but whatever, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like all of those things, but the business mindset sets you up for that. So you can start thinking about, okay, how do I need to move right now? What types of decisions do I need to be making long-term so that I put myself in a position to not have to do this forever because you can't in my opinion do private practice every day for the next 50 years it's draining and it's exhausting I don't care what population you serve I serve a really stable population Mm -hmm. my clients are high achieving professional women with high functioning anxiety we rarely have a crisis day but doesn't mean I don't get tired and Mm -hmm. I don't feel the heaviness of what they're experiencing so with the business mindset you can create a business model with a plan that says, okay, this is what I'm doing for the next two years. By year five, this is what I want to have in place. I want to hire another therapist. or I want to add coaching. I want to add online courses to help me maximize my lifestyle and continue to pay my bills. And you need a business mindset to do that because it's going to take you some money. You may have to pay a business coach to learn what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Facebook groups won't do it all. Yeah. YouTube University can't learn everything there. They're Mm -hmm. good resources, but the customized strategy for what you need, you may have to pay and get in a program to help you learn those things. And the business mindset says, okay, I do need to pay. Like we paid for grad school. We're still paying for grad school. Mm -hmm. And we had no problem doing that because like, oh, this is something I need. We need the business coaching too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Because like we're talking about, there's these huge gaps in our education. And I think that's where I've seen a lot of people fail with private practice or resent their private practice is because they had this maybe like idealized version of what it was going to be, but without having the right foundation 
they jump into it and it's not any better than an agency. They are sliding for everybody just to get clients in the door to make money. They have this right. scarcity mindset. They're taking all these clients who maybe don't fit because that's who called. And mm -hmm. it, it just ends up being the exact same thing as agency, except now you're the boss and you made this. So yeah. it's, if you don't have that business mindset right out the gate and you're not focusing on, this is a business first and then it's the client work second. Mm-hmm. It, you you just end up in the same trap it just looks a little different yeah and it's scarier because you can't like get out there's no like fmla if you need if you need a break yes. or you know you have a surgery like you got to build your own pto mm -hmm. and i i think for therapists what can help us do things like building that security in the business is by monetizing the other skills that we have. If you worked for an agency, you probably learned how to do admissions mm -hmm. and intake and scheduling and sometimes discharge planner. If they fire the discharge planner or they quit and you had all these people that needed placement, like we learned how to do a lot of things. So we need to package those things. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, sell them or monetize them in some way, even if it's just teaching other therapists how to do it and let that be our extra stream of income. And then yes, we build the PTO bank with that. Or yes, we build retirement with that and we create the emergency savings account. So if and when life happens, if you need maternity leave or whatever, now you have a cushion because you have to create your own benefits in private practice or you're gonna be broke and okay. looking for a contract job or going back to an agency, which is fine, but it could have been avoided had you had a business mindset and made better business decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like how you said to invest in yourself when it comes to business coaching, because people do pay all this money for grad school because it's the formalized way we're supposed to do things. But when it comes mm -hmm. to other forms of education, you got to seek it out and pay for it too, because I think sometimes people do feel that they could take certain shortcuts. Like you said, some of the Facebook groups, I see people a lot posting in there, like, can someone help me do this? But it, I think on two sides, one is you need to be willing to invest, but also if you're the person people are coming to, for yes. the advice and suggestions, you need to be willing to charge. So Absolutely. it's like you, you were talking about like, figure out what you're good at and market that. I've seen therapists who they're like, gosh, these same things keep coming up with some of my clients. Maybe I'll make a course about it. Maybe I'll start mm -hmm. writing a program. Maybe I'll do intensives. And then it's yeah. you know, short term, lots of work, but then the fees higher. So it's being able to adapt. And I like how you mentioned maternity leave too. Like different parts of your life can work with your practice your practice if it's set up in the right way from the get-go mm -hmm. so, yeah it sounds like having that business mindset and building those skills is essential to the success of your business yeah I think it is I've seen a lot of therapists fail at private practice their version of fail not mine but I think everything's a learning moment where we can yeah. move forward and learn the lesson but a lot of therapists they just don't do well in private practice because they were so focused on everybody else Mm -hmm. and well well they can't do sessions until seven o'clock no other healthcare provider is doing a service at seven o'clock at night because their kids have cheerleading practice yeah. they can move it or they can miss a night it's okay mm -hmm. and just learning that you don't have to sacrifice your entire life and your family and your your chill time with your friends or a girl's trip because you're a therapist like I don't that's not the kind of therapy I wanted to do and it's not the type of therapy I teach the therapists who are in my community and in my courses and in my programs I don't teach them how to do business that way because I don't think it helps you have longevity or to love your business if your business is whooping you and it's wearing you out and every time someone books a session you're like oh my god I gotta see them well if you're not ready to see more clients turn the button off it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be it doesn't have to be a conversation it's a business decision as a ceo i'm turning the button off i'm not accepting no more clients like we're done that's it exactly you raise your fee if you're like mm -hmm. i need more money but i'm not trying to add an extra day to my schedule bump your fee up some like Absolutely. there's so much flexibility here and i think that you're right like all of these skills, none of these skills were talked about in most grad school <laughs> programs. And so it's refreshing to hear somebody openly speak about them because I get, I think there's something that's been, I know there's something that's been like ingrained in a lot of people that private practice is bougie. That's for like the mm -hmm. therapists who don't want to work a lot. That's for the people who think they're better than agency work or hospital work. I mean, I think that's what either some grad school programs from what people have told me have flat out, they've been told that 
through their professors, yeah. their programs, or like mine, it just wasn't discussed at all. Even though I know two or three of the professors I had were in private practice and they were adjunct here. So how come you guys aren't talking to me about what you do <laughs> for the rest yeah. of your free time? Like, so it's just crazy, but I think it's, um, it's great that you're out here talking about these things. So to go into that for the therapists who are watching this, who feel like there's these gaps in their education, who want to pursue something business related, but maybe don't necessarily know where to start. What mm -hmm. steps would you recommend that they take if they are interested in building more of that like CEO mindset? Yeah. So in my CEO clinician framework, it's broken up into four parts. It's mindset, it's money, it's marketing, and it's movement. So mm -hmm. I'll give you guys <laughs> the quick, um, I'm um, oh Cliff Notes version mm -hmm. of what that <laughs> I'm with you. What that looks like. <laughs> So here's the summary. Here's what you need to know. So with the mindset piece, it's having that business mindset, learning how to make decisions faster, learning that this is a brand new skill for you. This is not about your clinical skills. You can have the best treatment plan on the planet. If you have no clients, you will not be able to use your treatment planning skills. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure we have that business mindset up front to understand marketing and not be intimidated by marketing and oh I'm scared to post on social media okay don't post but we got to figure out another strategy if you're not going to post you still have to market and so I teach therapists how to do both um, but we got to have the business mindset before we do anything and the belief that you can do it mm. you don't have to do it like everybody else does it you don't have to have a group practice I'm a solo practitioner I teach solo practitioners I, if you want to build a group I'm not your person I've never built a group I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in that area because it's mm -hmm. not what I do so having the business mindset making it customized for you the next part is the money like you got to get oh you got to get good with money mm -hmm. and be okay with charging your fees not charging your worth but charging based on the value that you can clearly communicate to your customers, which is your prospective clients, but also on what you can deliver. Can you help them get these panic attacks from five times a day to, down to two? Can you really do that? Have you done that? Can you tell people you have done that? Like, how do we communicate that? Yes, you're the person that deserves this $150 an hour or this $200 an hour. You can't set it because you feel like you deserve that, but you can't help people. Like that's mm -hmm. not how that works. So having the money mindset, if you have any scarcity mindset stuff going on from growing up in poverty or growing up as a single mom living in a tough area where y'all had just enough sometimes and sometimes you didn't have enough we got to work through that and not in the container of business coaching but maybe even in therapy so you can develop that money mindset piece and start charging what you need to be charging so you can take care of your family and so it makes sense and then we get to the marketing because we got to get the foundation ready. We got to get the business ready to do business. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about marketing. And in the marketing, I teach how to create a presence online and offline through building relationships. A lot of the therapists in my programs, they don't even have a website yet. I'm not saying don't have a website. I'm saying you can have a full practice and a full caseload and no website. That is an option. And then you take the money that you've made from the clients you're seeing and then go get the website and then go get SEO and then go do paid ads, do whatever you want to do. But now you're making money and you're not pulling from your personal money that you don't have much of to do business things. Mm -hmm. So the marketing can be fun. It can be really cool. You can meet a lot of people, but you're responsible for the relationships that you build. And your new referrals are going to come from the people you know, from the people who know you, and from the people who can clearly tell somebody else what you do in your practice. Because if that's not clear, oh, well, I think she does trauma. Cool. What type of trauma? Oh, mm -hmm. all of it. No, she doesn't. Yeah. Mil military combat vet, she's never treated them. That's, that's not what she does. Can't be. Mm -hmm. So making sure people are absolutely clear in your marketing and when they come to your directories or your website or even your social media profiles, I think every therapist needs a business page, at least like a LinkedIn page and a Facebook business page at minimum, but making sure that is very clear. Like this is who I help. This is who I serve. This is what I do. And the last part is the movement. Mm -hmm. What type of moves are we making? From a CEO leadership perspective, what are we doing? Who are we partnering with? Are we adding in podcasts? Who are we talking to about our practices? Are we going to events? Are we working as vendors or sponsors? Are we doing keynote speaking engagements? Are we creating contracts and collaborations and partnerships with schools and universities for staying straight there? I don't care, but the type of moves we got to start making those two to make sure you're getting more traction and you can make more money faster that doesn't require you sitting down with clients for one-to-one -one direct care. Mm -hmm. So recap, mindset and the money and the marketing and the movement. That is the CEO clinician framework. 
Damn. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I think that that's amazing because it covers all the major aspects. And each thing you mentioned is some of the biggest holdups I've seen people have. It's the reasons why they don't go into private practice because mm -hmm. one or all of those things aren't right. Um, it's the reason people don't, they, they build these practices that aren't sustainable is because they don't have some of these things in place. And I think for a lot of people, gosh, the money stuff is probably one of the hardest things because again, nobody talked about how to talk about money. And I know for me personally, I wasn't even in a place that anyone paid me directly until I don't eight, nine years in my career before it was mm -hmm. hospitals. It's community mental health where, like you said, amazing if somebody could pay a dollar that day right. otherwise medicaid covered everything or i was on base with the military and they didn't pay anything so it was mm -hmm. just like no one, i never had to have any conversations about money till years into my career and yeah. then once you start you're like oh god this is awkward especially if you have some of your own stuff so mm -hmm. i love that you mentioned that a lot of that gets pushed to the side because i think in some of these programs when people are discussing like triggers they're talking about like your personal stuff your mental health your past no one talked about money triggers or what no. that would look like so I mean even like having a client who's a lot wealthier than you having a client who has a lot less than you and what that may bring up so mm -hmm. I love that you incorporate that into your framework because there's everything related to business comes down to money yes it just does so and I'm sure you've seen that a lot in the work you've done with people how much that money aspect of it can really hold them back in a lot of ways yeah and even on the, on the therapy side with clients like yeah we got to have the money conversation because you need strong policies mm -hmm. are they paying a late fee is it fifty dollars or is it your full fee and mm -hmm. do you make sure you got the credit card on file like those little nuances like yep. huge but there's so many therapists who want to be flexible because they're more concerned about the client than making sure they get compensated for the service mm -hmm. and just the little things like, okay, don't put them on the calendar until you have a credit card or don't put them on the calendar until, <laughs> until you have all the paperwork and the forms because they're taking up space for another mm -hmm. client who's ready and has their, their stuff in. So yeah, all of the, the little nuances of money and understanding what you need to be charging. And if you're scared, identifying that you're scared and knowing what to do with it. That's module two of my course is called compensation made easy. And a lot of therapists, they call it the B word because I teach them how to budget. Like you need a budget for home and you need a budget yeah. for the practice. And you need to calculate all that. Like I give them the formula, like this is how much you need to make every month. Mm -hmm. And this is how we're going to get it. These are the different ways we can get you to this number, but it's a hard conversation and some of them get stuck. And I'm like, that's why you need coaching. So when you get yep. stuck, like I can help pull you through that area. But that money section is hard because until you get the mindset piece around the money and start having those internal conversations and the conversations with your clients through the informed consent process, like you may not make the money you're looking to make. I don't care how good the website is mm -hmm. and the SEO. Like that's, that's foundational. Yeah. And two, it's boundaries as well. That'd be like, you know, the other B word. <laughs> I think that comes with that is going to be those money boundaries because yeah. my clients know if you have a balance, you see so your car didn't go through from last week. We're not meeting this week. Mm -mm. Your appointment's canceled. We're not doing that. So my dentist won't let me carry about. I'm going today. That's why that's in my head. <laughs> but They're not gonna let me carry a balance. <laughs> like no. They're going to come after me. So how come that's acceptable in that type of business model and not over here when it's only on me? So yeah. if anything, it means more that you have those boundaries and things in place, because guess what? That money is going to affect my bank account a lot, a lot harder, a lot more noticeable than yes. it would a big company like that. So right. yeah, I think that's amazing that that's something that really needs to be looked at. So, and like you mentioned marketing as well, something else that wasn't taught in school, um, <laughs> that could be awkward and bring up a lot of stuff for people about showing up and being present. And there's, yeah, there's a lot there. So I love that your program sounds very like all encompassing to the major yes. like pillars of private practice. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's based off your experience, which I like too. Yes. Like I'm not making this up. I was, I was doing business coaching, like marketing and branding before I was working as an educator and I was doing marketing and branding consulting for entrepreneurs. So I've helped a lot of people build a lot of different businesses in a lot of different industries. So when I finally decided like, okay, I'm going to build a private practice. When I saw other therapists not making money, 
mm-hmm. and not having good marketing. I'm like, what? What is what happened? Like the master's degrees, license, all these certifications. Like, why are y'all struggling? Like, I don't understand. And so even the the therapists that I looked up to for mentorship that were guiding me on the licensure process and the three million hours we had to get, they didn't have good marketing. Mm-mm. And I'm like, this is cool. But I'm like, how are y'all getting referrals? Like, I wanted to know what's the offline strategy, but mm-hmm. also what's the online strategy? Because I'm not afraid to get on camera. So when I learned both, I was like, let me document the journey and document everything that I've done and everything that I've seen work for my older business coaching clients who are not therapists and the business coaching clients who are therapists. Like, I'm just going to package it, everything that works and all the different options and ways you can approach marketing in a way that works for you. So if you are older or you have a chronic illness or you're breastfeeding newborn baby like you can still do marketing but I'm going to teach you how to do marketing in a way that fits your lifestyle and based on where you're at Mm -hmm. yeah and I think it's kind of like with the client stuff right like you've got to focus on you first you can't just be like oh well there's a big need for trauma I don't have an an interest in it but hey there's a market for that let me do that it's the same with marketing Mm -hmm. you're gonna be like well everyone's on Instagram so let me get on Instagram if that's not aligned with who you are or where your audience is right So you have to figure out what's authentic to you because people, like you mentioned how clients could see pretty quickly, like you're not the one for me. (laughs) I think that your social media and same with other therapists too, you know, seeing how other people are marketing going, okay, I like what they're doing and what they put out there. I'll refer to them versus if it doesn't feel authentic, you're probably not. So hard pass. mm -hmm, Absolutely. But well, I know that you recently put all of this, you mentioned your book. So all of this is, I'm assuming included in your new book. It is. Yay. It is. It is. And I, I'm excited about the book. It was a different book project for me. This is my second book, but I went with a completely different writing coach and graphic designers, editing team, formatting, like totally different, but I wanted it to be, it's a short read because I didn't want it to be like a 300 page novel. Cause mm-hmm. I feel like if you're a new therapist, you already got a lot, <laughs> you already have a lot of stuff going on. And so I wanted it to be practical and t- can digest there are additional resources in the book that I am adding for people who get the pre-ordered copies um but also if you don't even if you get it when it comes out in January there's a whole set of separate resources that I've added in the book I've added specific podcast resources to each chapter of the book so you can hear me talk through and teach what I'm teaching in the book and I'm giving you practical action steps and homework like I want you to do the things take a screenshot send it to me so I can celebrate you you can ask me questions like I want it to be a relationship building book Mm -hmm. with me and the reader and I really want to walk alongside these therapists who are trying to build a private practice because I think it can serve you it can be a major asset to you and your family but it doesn't have to be complicated when Mm -hmm. I tell people I teach therapists how to build a practice in 60 days I really do like some of the therapists in my program they go from zero clients struggling with their mindset scarcity mindset really really scared to charge people to 20 clients by the end of six days 60 days Mm -hmm. so it is doable and I've got receipts to back it up I've got testimonial videos on my website to back it up and some written testimonials but I wanted the book to be a guide and a resource and a roadmap that new therapists could read a chapter and say whoo okay I can do this Kamisha made it simple she laid it out for me step by step I know what to do let me go implement this and then I'm moving on to chapter two like I Mm -hmm. wanted it to be something that they could use and feel confident in their ability to build a private practice in 60 days yeah and it sounds like the steps are realistic yes you know I think that's the problem I've seen with certain marketing tactics different coaches have used is it just feels like I don't know, a a nicer way to put it than kind of like scammy, (laughs) you know, it just feels like magical. And it sounds like yours is very practical and realistic Mm -hmm. and it's hitting the main points that you're going to need. And I like that you also incorporate for different learners too. There's, here's the book to read. Here's the stuff to listen to. Here's the worksheets to actually fill out. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Shout out to my education background because I'm a, I'm a visual learner, but I need to hear things multiple times before it clicks for me. And, and the therapists I tend to attract, they're also wired like that. Mm-hmm. So I try to meet them where they are. So they have as many touch points as they need so they can get it. And some of them, after they read the book, yes, they're going to buy my course. They're going to come do coaching with me. Cool. Some of them are not. And I'm fine with that. I just wanted to have a resource to support therapists in a practical way so they can see that it's possible for them to, and not just the market 
marketing gurus we love on Instagram, like yeah. for the for the everyday therapist in a small town that nobody knows about, it's possible for you too. And mm -hmm. I'm going to show you how to get it done. Yeah, that's so amazing. And I think that there needs to be more resources like this and also stuff that's affordable because like you mentioned, some of these big people who are out here marketing, their courses can be thousands of dollars and mm -hmm. good on them for charging if that's what they think that it's providing. But I think at the same time, it can be tough for some of the newer people starting out. So yes. I like that you have different levels of things depending on what the person needs and where they're at in their career or financially. Yeah, because I, I remember the days where I couldn't afford a course. I was like, well, let me watch the free webinars and save my money. And okay, they got a live video. Okay, cool. I'm going to watch the live video. I'm going to keep mm -hmm. saving my money. I'm coming to the course. It's going to take me a minute, but I'll get there. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure, like, if you're that therapist, because I remember the days that they had something that they could hold on to and still learn from instead of me being like, oh, well, you ain't got enough money. I didn't have the money either. Like, you know, we don't just come out the gate making the type of money we make now. It is a process and it takes some work and just some some finessing of systems and strategies and a business model and then yes things level out and it's amazing I love it here like I'm not I'm not going back I pray to God I get to stay here for a long time but mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that for the newbies that they had support as well yeah because I think that's probably one of the biggest barriers for them in achieving some of these goals is going to be that certain things are just kind of either gate kept or they're just out of their reach financially so mm -hmm. I like that you are breaking down some of those barriers of even these systems that are supposed to help others. You're breaking down the barriers of what exists and making yes. it just more accessible, which is Absolutely. really great. Well, for my last question, is there mm -hmm. any additional tips that you could think of for new therapists, any other advice or suggestions or resources that you think may benefit them? So additional tips for new therapists, I would say, even though you're scared, just do it scared whatever it is it may be yes listening to all the rest of samantha's podcast episodes on this youtube channel do it and if you have questions do it and reach out and ask questions if there is a webinar or a live video or a three-day challenge go and it's okay to be scared and still do the next best thing you don't have to just stay in your house and sit at your laptop and just stare and go through all the YouTube videos and beat yourself up about how you don't have a website with SEO. A lot of people don't. Even the people that are telling you they have SEO, they don't have SEO. And so that's okay. You can mm -hmm. just do the next best thing for you and move at a pace that is sustainable for you and ask questions. There are no dumb questions. You can get in my Facebook group, the CEO Clinician Community. We'd love to have you in there. Um, but we work in there. It's not a, hey, let's just hang out and watch. Like, no, no, what are you doing? What are you working on? What do you what do you need help with? Like, get connected so that people know who you are, know what you do. And I'll send you referrals. I'm that type of therapist. If yeah. you're in the middle of freaking Utah, I'm not in Utah. I don't know anybody who is in Utah. But if I see somebody looking for a therapist in Utah, yes, I'm going to name drop you because I'm just that type of person. And so when you're connected to people who see you and who know you and who know what you do, it's easier because we can also help you build your practice and we can also help you get referrals. So don't be afraid to do it scared. Just do the next best thing get connected and just know there are genuinely, genuinely people out here who love you and who care mm -hmm. about you and who want to see you succeed because, you know, Samantha and I, we remember the days yes. where it was hard and we were scared and we didn't have this thing figured out. So now that we've learned a little bit, mm -hmm. we are happy to share those things. So I would just say, get connected and do the next best thing for you. And don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Yeah, exactly. And collaborate. Right. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things, there are certain people in this profession that, you know, maybe aren't as collaborative and more competitive, but find those people who are collaborative, who are going to look out for you, who will, like you said, name drop and be able to put your, your info out there because they honestly, we need them because we're pulling away from some of the one-on-one -on -one work. So anybody else that wants to open a practice, you're helping us out because Absolutely. I keep going down in how many days I see clients. So period. thank you. Please come out yes. and open a successful practice because I need somewhere to send these people. <laughs> and it's the same yeah. for you, I bet. 
Yeah. And I think that's like the circle of life of a therapist. You know, you mm-hmm. come in the hard way, agency, inpatient, residential, yeah. like community mental health, and then you go to private practice and then you start exploring other options. Like somebody's got to come behind us and like take up the baton and run the next lap. And we're here to help y'all do that, but we can't help you if we don't know you. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We want to help. <laughs> <laughs> so please go into private practice. Please read her book. Please take these steps yes. to work on you because there's just such a need for mental health providers at this point. We can't have the ones that exist being burned out or being no. letting fear hold them back from some of what they want to accomplish. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, thank you. I know you're busy. So thank you for taking the time to do this today. Of course. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And so for all the people watching, all of Kamisha's info is going to be below. So pre-order her book. That'll be linked front and center for you guys to do that. And follow her social media as well. That's how we got connected was through social media. So yes. Let's keep it going. You guys follow us. Um, But (laughs) if you want to stay tuned with different episodes, see what's coming up, then subscribe to the channel. But thank you again, Kamisha. It was great to talk to you. You too. (laughs) Bye. Bye, guys. 